Welcome to the Beyond 3D podcast, where we explore all things 3D and the important role that 3D data plays throughout the manufacturing process, driving decisions throughout a product's life cycle. Here, we talk with industry analysts, business owners, developers, and industry influencers, and hear real stories that you can relate to and learn from, and know which trends and technologies apply to your business. So join us as we go Beyond 3D. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Beyond 3D Roundtable. This is Ron Fritz, CEO at TechSoft 3D. And once again, we've got a phenomenal panel of industry leaders here to talk about interesting topics. Today, that topic is uh, the things that we're surprised about that are not yet solved in our industry, things we thought would be possible by now that still aren't or they're still harder than they should be. And then we'll take a look forward uh, in time and try to predict some of the things that that will be possible in the years ahead. So to make sure we kick it off right so that everyone has some context, we'll kind of go around and do a quick um, set of introductions. I'll start by where the locations are in my Zoom window. So let's let's start with you, Sam. Um, Great, thanks, Ron. Uh, Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Sam Burgess. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Samsung VT. And we're digitalizing the aftermarket uh, with immersive technologies, bringing it into the 20, even the 21st century will be nice, but hopefully even the 22nd century. Um, <laughs> so what a lot of people don't realize is that the aftermarket is an incredibly rich and, uh, and, and hugely uh, and a massive growing opportunity. Um, the aftermarket, I, t- I tell this a lot of the aftermarket is like a forgotten toy, like Andy from Toy Story. It often gets pushed to the bottom of the toy box and everybody really forgets just what potential that toy has. Um, and with um, with US uh, US consumers and businesses spending a trillion dollars every year just on assets they already own, it really just sort of highlight just uh, the potential for the after sales industry. And in essence, what we're doing through immersive technology in our platform, we're we're accessing that enriched, highly valuable data at source, the CAD data, optimizing it in the cloud, and then presenting that as a parts catalog um, um, to consumers around the world via mobile phone and tablets. And we're currently, we went through a seed investment round last year, and um, we're giving up for um, uh, for another investment round uh, in summer this year, and uh, as our growth sort of continues to skyrocket. And that's me. Brilliant. Um, how about over to you, Andy? Afternoon, everyone. I'm Andy Cheadle. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at CloudNC. Um, software engineer across 25 years. Work many sectors, telecoms, automotive, cyber, defense, healthcare, and now manufacturing. Um, and uh, I work at CloudNC. It's a manufacturing technology and precision parts manufacturer based out of the UK. So very privileged to build technology and run a factory that consumes that technology. Um, our focus is on software automation, um, technology and solutions, with the ultimate mission to realize what is variously called lights up manufacturing, autonomous precision manufacturing. But for us, perhaps the closer term today is, you know, single click precision parts manufacture. Um, And I suppose it is to subtractive manufacturing, what the upload and print workflow is to 3D uh, 3D printing um, and additive manufacturing. but I'll claim with just a few more challenges, um, but I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, mm-hmm. So we're, um, as I said, we've got a factory in Chelmsford in the UK. We've got a technology office in, in London, um, and we're building automation solutions currently focused around cam, cam automation and autonomy. So um, I use the analogy of autonomous vehicle um, driving levels and if you think of level five autonomy that's driver out the loop um and then at level three you have lane keep assist um you know uh park park assist those kind of driver aid technologies and we're doing we're surfacing similar things in to leading um cam packages with the form of of catchily titled product called cam assist which is really um aiming to produce a CAM program at at the single click of a button that gets you 50, 60, 70, 80% of the way there, and then you clean it up. Um, Mm -hmm. And we're a Series B startup 
um, privileged to have investors, Autodesk, um, Lockheed Martin, um, and, and the like. Great. So from a couple of different startups to um, Milan, who works for a big company, Hexagon, but uh, runs the Sixth Sense program, who deals with some very early stage companies. O over to you, Milan. Hi, I'm Milan Kusik. I run an uh, open innovation platform in Hexagon called uh, Sixth Sense. Um, it's mostly tied to our division, Manufacturing Intelligence, today. Um, we formed this for a basic reason why a lot of corporates do things, which is we trying to find a better way to work with startups um, and not a traditional accelerator where you come into the program and we you know, shake some hands and then you get a check at the end. This is more focused on working together with startups to generate projects that are jointly put together either for a customer specifically or for hexagon technology. Um, it's a typical 10 week program, a couple of cohorts a year. We just finished our second cohort. Um, we are mostly interested in, let's say, post seed, seed A, seed A plus companies because there's a product market fit, there is um, an idea, there is a lack of scale. So, what can we do that we can actually generate things? We don't have a CVC arm, which means early stage is probably not the best fit for us. Uh, although, Never say never, things always change. Um, but I would say we had over last year since we were formed, we had a couple of hundred uh, startups applying. We ran through two cohorts, which means about 15 companies went through. Uh, and now we're focusing for this first half of this year is to try to create outcomes so that the startups can point to the program and say, there's something good that comes out of it. But my background just as a, well, I've been a hexagon forever. And I agree with Sam, my first half of my life was in aftermarket. And I believe there's a lot of money to be in the aftermarket. So I'll just agree with that 100%. Uh, but my second half of my career has been mostly in innovation. And I have like, I don't know, 30 something patents to my name. And I've been working on that part. So now we're trying something new uh, within the next. So that's it. And if we play our, if we ask nicely, you'll play us a song. With some of that equipment. That's right. I mean, this there. is a, it's always yeah. a fallback career. You always have to have something. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. <laughs> you know, if the conversation lags and it gets boring, we can always get it <laughs> to that. But I would imagine a lot of these startups you deal with in Sixth Sense are, are, are actually taking advantage of some of these things that we may have thought would be possible by now, but aren't and filling those, filling those gaps. Uh, and uh, Suchit, fresh off the heels of 3D experience world. Um, I know that uh, you and I have, talked about these things a lot over the years, beginning all the way back when you were with SRAC in Los Angeles. Uh, so go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, so as you said, Ron, uh, my name is Suchit Jain. I'm uh, currently working with the So Systems uh, SolidWorks. Uh, around, I'd say around 28 years, I've uh, been in this uh, CAD CAM industry. Uh, as uh, Ron, you mentioned from my early days of SREC, my background, I'm a finite element analysis engineer. This is what I studied. Uh, with Dassault and SolidWorks, as you guys know, I mean, we are pretty much entrenched in this manufacturing sector. As we say, right, uh, everything you see around us uh, is probably, you know, we size it around 60 to 70 percent of everything, plastic, metal, whatever, is probably touched our software tools, uh, you know, by our customers. Uh, and as you mentioned, 3D Experience World, we were there last uh, last week. Big event. We call it the engineering, sort of the uh, burning man for engineering type of thing. A lot of passionate, <laughs> a lot of passionate users and uh you know, I've 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 kind of three hats within uh, within the source systems, uh, especially around the solid roads. We you know we focus on the mainstream market as we call it, uh, and uh, the mainstream market, of course, is about you know people who, as in in a typical American slang, we will say, "Show me the money now," right? It's not don't mm -hmm. show me the future ten years from now, but show me the money now. What can you do? So they are more, you know, our customers a lot of times looking for return on investment. Uh, in a in a very short time and so on, uh, uh, so the, the three things: strategy and planning. This is all around M and A, technology acquisitions, uh, product uh, packaging, etc. For for the, for the company, you know, understanding the market needs and trying to grow it. Of course, SolidWorks is a very established product, so we always are looking for new new ways we can grow and so on. So that's one strategy planning is one uh, early engagement. Uh, is something I 
I mean, I, I know you probably understand it, but you know, we coined it. This is our startups, uh, students, and makers, uh, because we believe, you know, when it comes to students, we've been. I'm personally very passionate about it. It's a virtuous circle for us. You know, students go to school, they learn our software, come and innovate, whether they work for somebody or start their own company. So our goal here is to nurture sort of that sentiment, that passion. We do it in several ways. So Milan, I'll be happy to talk with you with the kind of what you are doing. We work with a lot of incubators, accelerators. We have our own incubator program as well, which is one part of it. The other arm for us on the stardom is really empowering these guys with uh, easy access to software, when they're innovating and also all the network and everything else which comes along for them to become a successful business. Uh, so we work in that middle tier of early engagement with students, with makers, uh, with Fab Labs, Fab Foundation. We have a lot, a lot of projects all across the world uh, where we enable places where manufacturing and technology is hard to get. Uh, so we work with Fab Foundation, MIT, all of those kinds of organization. And then the last piece, which I'm particularly passionate about is, and I have a lot of good experience uh, around, I have a whole thesis around it, if you will, is our user community, uh, uh, which is very large. We've got 7 million or so uh, users, uh, you know, commercial education, everything else included. And so my team's goal is to, to create, create a passion among, I mean, well, nurture their passion mm -hmm. so they become active salespeople. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And I have, by the way, Ron, you uh, and the team here, one of the things I've been thinking lately is, you know, how uh, we talk about disruptive innovations and how they disrupt companies, SolidWorks, all these, you know, we've been in the business for so long, ready for disruption. But I have a thesis that the network phenomena can slow down disruptive innovation. Not that we don't need to be aware of it, but having passionate users which go beyond just the functional need, but it appeals to their emotional side of things where they're doing good for mm. society in general. Uh, you know, uh, you've got a strong stickiness uh, thing in there. So I encourage companies right, to right. in that direction. Right, gotcha. Uh, how about you, Tyler? Tell us everything we need to know about Tyler Barnes. Yeah, that's going to be a quick, quick story. <laughs> um, Sujit, I, I liked your um, analogy about 60%, 70% of the built world um, having touched your software. Ron Ron and I talk about that a lot because obviously at TechSoft, that's, uh, we're under the hood in a lot of these things. And so we're the invisible company that touches almost everything that's, that's built. Um, Tyler Barnes, I'm <clears throat> president of TechSoft 3D. I've only been that for a month and a half. So <laughs> to, it, it's not it's not a, a role I'm really familiar with yet. Um, prior to that, I was at TechSoft that hard. That hard. <laughs> business <laughs> development and marketing for the last eight years. I think I've met many of you through that. Um, I got to know TechSoft and Ron through a, a long time, a long stint at Autodesk, um, all in the me mechanical design um, side of the business. So did a lot of different things, um, a number of roles in marketing. I moved to the product strategy side. And when I left, I was um, running the inventor product line and associated um, services around that. I also licensed hoops. And so I knew TechSoft 3D very well through my experience doing that. Um, and here I am eight years later, hoping to never work in another company other than TechSoft again. <laughs> Not good. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So we don't need to go in any particular order. And I, and what, in my experience, once the conversation kicks off, it's, it's controlled mayhem. So it's, so let's see, I'm going to randomly, I'll pick on you, Andy, to start somewhere. So, you know, you've been really close to manufacturing, how things get manufactured in the high precision area. Here we are 2000, 23, which is a, I almost said 2013. It's so hard for me to like, really, are we there already? 2023. And you think like, well, what made you pull all your hair, hair out? I, I can tell you what made me pull all my hair out. What made me pull all your hair out and say, I cannot believe that here we are in 2023 and this still isn't solved or. Um, yeah. I mean, 
it's interesting. I think I've got two answers to that, and they probably segue into each other. Um, uh, one, one, you know that I'll rant on wrong, so you'll have to cut me off. But really, you know, what's been interesting <laughs> about getting into manufacturing um, is that everyone talks about, you know, industry X dot Y um, and digital connectivity, etc. And yet, you know, I work with factories and, and users and shop floors that simply aren't ready for the digital transformation. I mean, that's been a fad word for a while, but they literally have not been digitally transformed, ready to receive the technologies that we're building. Um, and so we can advance all we like, but actually we're not finding it that easy to bring customers along. Um, if I want to go and digitally enable a factory, I've probably got to go and grapple with its ERP system, MRP system, PLM system, and then into its design tools. And, you know, what drives me, well, pretty much nuts, especially as someone who's trying to achieve automation and ultimately autonomy, is the lack of the digital thread throughout all of this. So the interchange mm -hmm. formats, I mean, Hoops, you know, is is great at servicing this. Um, but ultimately, people have been talking about MBD for years. And, you know, as a software engineer and a computer scientist, I'm used to having digital interchange formats like that. And I, I am literally amazed that people talk about it and then are mm -hmm. chucking around PDFs uh, on the shop floor, writing notes. Um, and, you know, we... You know, at Cloud and Sea, we've purposefully kind of ignored all of that and kind of um, had to work out how to disrupt ourselves and avoid picking all mm -hmm. the available software off the shelf to start yeah. the integration pain that then suddenly does start to hold you back as you build up this big estate of, of um, kind of very heterogeneous but disconnected software mm -hmm. yeah that makes total sense that the yeah that the, the advances we could be making are held back by yeah the the old technologies that are hard for people to let go of anyone want to pick up on any of that thread milan you got your hand raised like like a polite student <laughs> go well hang on i think it's, i don't know if there's a hand raised in teams there's a hand raised thing but here let's 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 get to the technology piece I feel like a lot of people innovating the future have never actually been to a factory. Uh, I guess it's a best way to put it. Um, an example for that is like the DNA where I come from is uh, metrology and inspection and quality and that piece. And we talk a lot about, Andy, you know, PMI data and PMI data is going to help everything. And I've been talking about PMI data since I was like 12, you know, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's the future, it's the future and the future apparently never is going to arrive. Um, so my, my thing is like, and I think just as a statistics, we went and did research, 75% of factories still use a 2d print with a highlighter to inspect stuff. Yeah. So preparing technology for people, um, who are not ready to receive it, it seems like, a you know, a mouse wheel, you just kind of go in circles and you seem to not get there. I think the idea is addressing the real problems where it is and how to get there. And then we can talk about industry 4.0, 5.0, 6.0, whatever the story might be. I think that the same thing comes from kind of where you guys are, which is a digital reality piece. Uh, I went through virtual reality, augmented reality, extended reality, metaverse, and here we are 25 years later, and we still don't know what the hell we're going to do with this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it has to do with content, how it's delivered, and is it how useful is it in the bigger scheme of things. Um, we just kind of the struggle with some of the startup because you know they like to dream big, but you're like, okay, but what exactly are you fixing on on a ground level? So to me, a lot has to do with content. A lot has to do how easy it is. Example of that is I think all you guys went through the last ten years. We're gonna all have a three D printer at home, and we're gonna three D print every single component that's in our house. And people forgot to mention that you have to also be a CAD engineer to do that. Um, so. I think technology is there, but the struggle is always to find that perfect mm -hmm. ease for it and to end this mm -hmm. point, which is sometimes pencil and paper is all you need. I mean, I'm just being like, maybe yeah, it's right. commercial. Right. That's, right. Uh, that's all you need. You don't need. The, the ancients built a lot of impressive buildings. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Rhonda, 
I, I have a, as Milan, you were talking something, so a thought came to my, I haven't thought about this before, but a, th a thought came to my mind. You know, is it, if I take the car analogy, right? What Elon Musk did with the, uh, with the electric car, because you, you know, cars existed and they were very, you know, they were functional, they were doing the job. However, Elon had to make a lot of investments and uh, ha had a conviction to create a, a car from ground up, which was software driven. And, and now he's using AI and all the new technology and you can't use those technology in existing cars. My point on the machines is, is, is it that, yeah, we keep on talking about software, but the hardware, the machines which are running are still using the old paradigm and they are not changing. And, and maybe somebody like Ilan in this industry needs to come up where they create an equivalent of a CNC machine, because we are talking about high precision here, uh, you know, create a machine which has all the things, Milan, you're talking about with the inspection and all the things, but it's software driven with the probably Andy software on the cloud and, uh, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But that's what I'm thinking is needed. And those things just don't come like that because, uh, I mean, look, uh, all the Haas machine, you know, the, all the post-processing, I mean, look, it's the same thing we deal with every day. You know, the, the people who know the post-processing are the experts and, and you can create all the automation you may like, but they're not good enough or fast enough and all of that because those machines are still the, the same old mm -hmm. machine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sam, Sam, you were uh, in a race to break in there. Something's on your mind. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, so much of that resonates. You know, coming coming at this from the end of the the end of the chain, really, in the in the after sales, the aftermarket, all the problems you guys have just described. You know, we we just see that. And when when we first started the company, we we were, we were a little bit hesitant with who we approached because we thought, oh, these guys, they're, they're all over it. You know, they had this big you know global reputation reputation, and you know, we just there was an assumption there that we made that that you know they they wouldn't need our technology because surely these guys are doing this already. They're not still pumping out a big ring binders of paper based um, parts catalogs that isn't a thing anymore and and to our surprise unfortunately it is, it is still a massive standard within the industry despite all the you know industry 4.0 talk and and the amount of times i picked up a magazine that talks about industry 4.0 i've just not really seen it apart from outside of the siemens congleton factory i've not really seen anybody else fully embracing that so we just see it on a day-to-day -day basis and, um, and and the opportunities that are missed because of that are just phenomenal we I often talk about the, the thing that simplified, that sums it up for me. I, I talk about this a lot. Ron and Tyler, you, you, I may have mentioned I do a little bit about mountain biking. But, um, <laughs> You've said uh, it a time or two, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I, uh, I, I bought a very expensive German power washer and, um, uh, and it broke recently. And it broke because of a seal right in the middle of the power washer. So I went on the, the website of this, this manufacturer's um, uh, website to buy a new seal, and I just couldn't buy it. I, I had the serial number of, the, of the, the model. I had everything that I needed to, to find that part, and I couldn't do it. So I went onto eBay, and I found a counterfeit Chinese component. It cost me $2, so I bought that instead, and there were two big problems with that. One, there's a brand damage reputation, because I've just spent 350 quid on a very expensive German power washer that is now held together with a $2 um, um, Chinese uh, O-ring. Um, and then, uh, and then on top of that, there's a reliability maintainability issue. Um, and then, and then on top of that, the third one I'll say is that this particular German uh, manager has lost lost out on revenue because I'm now buying counterfeit um, aftermarket parts, not the OEM. So the entire industry is fragmented and broken, and that's what we're really trying to address. And we see it on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Tyler, anything spring to mind for you through all of that? No, I, it's as Suchit was talking, it just um, part of it, part of it goes back to who we're trying to deliver solutions and software to. It's a very conservative group. If you go down to the designer level, um, Suchit, I know at least you and I have gone through the 2D to 3D um, chasm cross. And a lot of this, you know, that took 15 years and it was about as obvious that it needed to happen as it could be. And it's still, you know, for mid-sized manufacturers in the Midwest of the United States, <clears throat> it still took a long time for them to adopt it. And I think that's that's part of it. I, I was working on the product plan for um, geometric dimensioning and tolerances and, and PMI for Inventor 10 years ago, and it had been on our roadmap for 10 years, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I remember talking to, this was, 
actually, I remember because it was right as COVID started, things were locked down. And I was talking to a, uh, uh, the early days of things being locked down. I was talking to a startup in Israel that had 3D in their name. I don't remember the name of the company, but they were an IoT company. Um, and I thought, oh, maybe there's some things we could do together. And we were talking and they said, no, no, actually, we are at the very lowest end of the market. And they were saying, everyone's talking about industry 4.0. But the vast majority of places where things get built are really small factories and smaller shops. And all this company did was actually go around and attach sensors to machines so that the person who owned the place could know what percentage of time are machines on or off. And even just that little bit of information was hugely valuable to them. And this company was growing like crazy. You know, meanwhile, a lot of uh, you know industry 4.0 is getting all the attention, but the need was still so basic. And yeah. it comes down to that hardware, what the hardware can and can't do. And those yeah, capital the, expenditures, they're not going to replace that hardware very easily. Ron, somebody who might be interesting value add to this conversation might be the ProtoLab, maybe Robert, Robert from ProtoLab, you know, Robert, uh, Robert Border. Because Pearl Lab, I believe, has done something where they have achieved because they are in the service industry, whether it's CNC or uh, you know injection molding, they have done a good level of automation, and they they are you know they've done. If you talk to them, they have like if every every company was like that, you know, who's producing uh, parts, I think it'll be good level of automation. But they are able to do it because that's their bread and butter, and they had it to do it. So they have done a good integration of software. Some of these things you guys are talking about, uh, they've automated where they're not looking at 2D drawings and things like that. So, I mean, you know, absolutely, um, Suchit. I think, you know, I, I, I chat to some of the, the classic CAM vendors and when we were only building software for our factory, they would say, oh, well, you have it easy because you're building solutions for standardized equipment that you can pick on your shop floor rather like proto labs but in the in the vendor space we're building packages for everyone and so as a result we have to be able to serve everyone so it's inordinately more complex and that made me think and while they had a point i actually turned to them and said well that's true but every time someone comes to you and says i need a tool path that can add that that pattern on you know uh, that that on on the part um, they go and add it and they go and add the checkbox and the configuration items and they didn't in my opinion stop and go do you really need it and are you willing to pay the true cost for developing that because actually the thing that automation brings is opinionation so I talk about being opinionated. Uh, in the automation, so opinionated automation, because if we're not opinionated about how we produce mm -hmm. something, the quality, time, trade-off, etc., then ultimately we have to build the CAM packages the traditional way that gives the human in the loop every fine-grained bit of control, and that's not how you achieve automation. It's mm -hmm. by being opinionated, taking some decisions, Doing, removing, and you know, it's not about labor elimination, which people worry about for automation. It's about enabling the human to do less of the menial or uh, simpler kind of painful and, and repetitive, but low value tasks and actually equip them, free them up to do the higher value tasks in, an, in their opinionated way. I seem to always follow Andy, so I'll just follow what he said with, <laughs> with, uh, with a couple of nuggets of what I think. I said, first thing, I think the next big thing is a lot of little things. I think a lot of corporates spend talking about the next big thing, but not taking care of the little things. And I think if you do innovation in those little co concepts, eventually you solve the bigger problems. I said, secondary, I think a lot of people focus on components of things versus a system thinking. So what exactly yeah. is the system you're trying to deliver to the end user from what is the usage? Kind of what Andy mentioned, what is the actual problem you're trying to address? And I'll mention just a quick anecdote, something that we did, you know, Hexagon is known for CMMs and a bunch of other things, um, but we went into the 
field and we studied our customers and we see what they wanted to do and we came back. And the typical thing when you're doing an engineering technology driven company is you ask people, so what do you think customers want? Faster, better, you know, that, that, that take yeah, everything yeah. is about performance. It turned out the thing that people hate about CMMs is they don't have enough light, so they can't see the work surface. Um, so it was just, <laughs> put some, put some, you know, I mean, that was the, the extent of fancy innovation, because I think we sometimes put ourselves in a trap that it has to be so sophisticated to kind of boost our own egos about being innovative, when sometimes innovative yeah. stuff is relatively simple. Uh, and I think the point that Andy was trying to make, I think, and I'm trying to reinforce that, is you have to get into the field and you have to watch what people do. Because I also agree that AI should really be assisted intelligence for most of people, not necessarily replacing people, but to assist people to do better jobs in the bigger scheme of things. Sam, you were, you were uh, getting in the field. That's a perfect example. You were talking about your actual example of trying to get just this little <laughs> piece that you needed for this power washer. And, uh, and Milan, you mentioned that you spent half your career in aftermarket. So what, why is it that, that manufacturing companies aren't paying attention to that? We're in a connected world. Like you could, that, that German power washer company could be selling parts mm. to people all over the world. They don't need a huge distribution network of local resellers, et cetera. Why, why do they persistently ignore that piece? Um. I think I think there's a couple of things. I think I think the um, there's a lot of focus on the on the um, you know you got you guys know this more than I will you know from the from the designers you know all the focus is on the new you know that's why I use the Toy Story example. It's what's new, the mm. latest design. If you get my experience, is you tell a designer he's working in the after you know he's supporting after sales projects. Mm. You know that's is where you're going to get into leave really, isn't it? You know because it's not the new sexy thing. So it's like getting hired to fix so fix bugs and software. You're not going to do yeah. any features. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no one is interested in that. That's the rubbish job. So uh, th there's that. But the crazy thing is, you know, we do, I'm, I know these stats off the top of my head at the moment because we're going. We're, I've just started my investment campaign again. But you know, there's two and a half times more profitability in 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 part sales than there is in um, uh, new equipment sales. So it's mm. a massive opportunity. And I, I think there's. I think it's 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 difficult to get right. I think that's probably the other thing as well to get that connectedness to get your own data sorted. The amount of times that we've spoke to big, large OEMs and we've asked for just a simple S bomb service bill of materials. Uh, and I mean, I mean, you know, you you can hear the screams in the background where you know people are just running around. They just don't have the information, and they're so um, it's just not a priority. And I think for us, it's a real education in the market is telling people that it is worth the time investing in getting your information right because actually um, it will pay dividends in the, in the end not only will you sell more parts but you'll deliver a better brand experience mm. to your customers and it, and it just becomes a win-win situation mm. so mbd and pmi was mentioned a few times as well as this sort of uh magical level of information that is gonna is, is the critical piece to automation and once we have that sorted we can move on from there so all the CAD systems now are pretty darn good at generating PMI. Um, and is it, we, you, you guys identified a couple of different barriers. One is the fun foundational elements of other technologies that are out there, like different machines being able to be sophisticated enough to have the software that can interpret the PMI. There's cultural differences. Well, that's just the way we do it. We print it out. We use a highlighter. Um, is that it? Are there other things that are stopping PMI from driving automation? From, from my experience, which is obviously at the tail end of the thing, not from the design necessarily perspective, is that um, it's a skill set. You know, if you just press a magic button and nothing against SolidWorks or any other systems, is mm -hmm. there's built in intelligence to do that stuff. But sometimes that intelligence cannot decipher from a high precision machining part and a washing machine. Because I remember being in Mexico, this was like 10 years ago, there was PMI data, but the tolerance callouts were so tight that they were failing every single sheet metal part, which, you know, it was like four millimeters opening. Like, I mean, it's a, it's a sheet metal for washing machine. It doesn't have to be high precision. And I think it's the intent versus anything else. Now, it, there might be that there's a silver lining to all this, that the advances in artificial intelligence with the amount of data that you can bring into the process would help 
get PMI to be uh, slightly in a better space. So I think there might be like an inflection point where this kind of automatic PMI will get to a place where it's sustain, you know, sustainable and, and it works. But that's been the past problem in general that we have seen. And then other ones, I don't know, what is it? Less than 20%, less than 15% of companies have any sort of PMI on their uh, 3D data. So it's that's why we always revert back to 2D prints mostly. Mm -hmm. And maybe part of it also is which uh, I, 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 I know that in the construction in, industry, everybody suffers to, which is the accountability, right? I mean, these things are costly and paper, paper trail seems to be still a better, like, you know, if you have disjointed, not everybody working for one company sort of a thing and you give something, well, hey, here's the PDF on which you signed off on and then you measure against that versus a digital model. If it's, you know, not in my vault and it goes outside of it, well, it's no longer the, the, the single version of truth. Uh, I, I think that sort of mentality is quite pervasive everywhere. You know, in CAD world, we used to call it the pizza box. You know, the, the one, the best way of moving uh, uh, sign, sign offs is in a pizza box, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> in a pizza box. So, so I think there is part of that as well. Maybe it's because you know, everything is uh, also uh, fragmented or there are many players perhaps in the chain that that paper record becomes. Yeah. Uh, like like mm -hmm. in SolidWorks case, you know, Ron, you mentioned MBD and, you know, you guys are helping us. You've helped us. TechSoft uh, has helped us. And we've been after it and we thought it'll go away. You know, John Paolo has stood mm -hmm. up and said, well, we won't, don't want drawings. Well, it doesn't matter what we want or we don't want. It's what the customers <laughs> want. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, what resonates for me with Susha is that, you know, that fragmentation you refer to, it it starts because people have historically gone, I'm a designer, and then I'm I'm gonna pass off to the manufacturer. And they've they've separated and created these barriers in the process. And actually, you know, we're beginning to see people say, you know. Put the designer and the and the manufacturer together. Allow them to iterate on the design with DFM tooling, um, and carry that conversation across. But previously, someone told me a great story. I, I won't name names, but they were working um, in one of the um, the new space companies and having to produce parts. And they were producing foam parts um, that to that turned out that they were producing them to a tight tolerance and the part cost, you know, $3,000 or something. And the reality is they didn't need it to that tight tolerance. And the, the manufacturer was like, why are you specifying it to this tight tolerance? And the, the designer is like, oh, I used the defaults in the package. And so, you know, you've got this plethora of configurations, a lack of guided workflow and integration through through the through the packages and the interoperability, and I think that really hinders, um, you know, it hinders the efficiency of even skilled people. Let alone, you know, a manufacturing environment where a skills shortage is being massively acknowledged now. Mm -hmm. Which is where probably this okay. costing and everything comes into play as well, because in your example, perhaps the designer probably is thinking their mind. You know, the higher the precision, he will never go wrong type of a thing. So it's accountability, not understanding mm -hmm. the business need and where that maybe, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. and that happens all the time, right? <laughs> it, all, it happens all the time. Right. Yes, yeah, so you still need, even with software defaults that, that do choose some opinion, the opinion uh, in, your, in this case, Andy, being more precision is better, uh, which is not, you still need. You know, you're still at this point where you need a, a person with some sense and some experience to say, yeah, that 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 doesn't that default or that opinion doesn't make sense in this yeah, case. Yeah, absolutely, Ron. And actually, our product development, um, I think, you know, my founders challenge me every day. Um, they 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 want the product faster. We all want it faster, but the reality is that we're having to go through user experience iterations to work out what is the right level of opinionation, automation, and human in the loop configuration, parameterization, mm -hmm. trade-offs, um, and sliders of, I want it fast, I want it slow, I want 
you know, prototype, I want batch, I want accurate, I want fast. Those are the kinds of things we're having to investigate. But more people need to take that system thinking uh, when it comes to the entire uh, portfolio integration. Mm. I'm realizing that we move this. I should always know this is going to happen. The conversation rolls and then it's almost 45 minutes have gone by. We haven't we, we touched a little on what the you know, the future may hold. And we've also just spent a lot of time talking about the stuff that we thought for sure would be solved by now that isn't. So I realize that a future projection is exceedingly risky, but we'll maybe do a, you know, rapid fire. Like we're, we're looking ahead five years from now. There's a, there's a lot of things happening in, in AI now uh, that, that may change things. What do we think if we were five years from now to say, well, that's that sorted, at least, you know, We've, we've moved past that and it's a significant impact. Um, Sam, let's, let's start with you. I mean, it's, it's funny, you know, like you said right at the start, you know, we're all talking about innovation. We have these grand ideas of what, what that should be. And actually, you know, just parts advisors not using WhatsApp to, for, for mm -hmm. 90% of all their parts transactions would, would be a huge <laughs> step for, for, for most of the people we're talking to, which is crazy. Yeah. Not using WhatsApp. <laughs> right. Right. How about you, Andy? Um, I probably failed in my job if I have not bought an appropriate level of single click to make or um, mm. levels of autonomy around cam, cam, simpl cam program simplification and automatic generation. So um, we are getting there. We're making fantastic progress against prismatic parts. Um, the challenge is always pushing into you know, fixtures are the bane of my life and something that I constantly talk to the team about when we've solved, you know, how you reduce a metal block down to the part geometry. You still got these damn fixtures to worry mm -hmm. about. Um, so denting that meaningfully, I'm going to put my money on that just because I have to, because I'm yeah. so heavily involved <laughs> in it. Um, yeah. I'm not going to put, I'm not going to put any money on, the MBD uh, having been solved though, uh, or the interop having got that much better, but I'd love people to rise to that challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, Tyler, you got anything that you want to throw out there? It's kind of a, you know, you already mentioned it. It's it's AI, but I I just I think it's in in small in small places all along the design to manufacture process. So we talked about MBD and the challenges of authoring gd &T. It It's true. And the software that does that is really old and, you know, making help, software that helps you make better decisions, um, but isn't making all the decisions for you. And, you know, I think that goes to generative design and being able to work through tons of different design concepts to analysis. So I think that, just as a technology that probably has the biggest um, potential to impact the most different things along kind of the entire chain. Yeah. Help people, help humans <clears throat> make better decisions for sure. So Chit, how about you? Any final thoughts about the future? You know, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm very bullish on AI in general for a lot of different fields. You know, I've been experimenting myself here and I know from a design perspective, I think there's a lot going on in there uh, in terms of, you know, this automation of manufacturing, uh, all of that. I, I do think that the AI would, in five years, I think five years, you know, we are in the exponential technology. So five years is a lot of time to tell you, frankly, mm -hmm. I would say even in a shorter time, maybe in a in couple of years, we'll start to see this costing, you know, like the example, Andy, you gave about the person making the wrong decision on the precision. Uh, probably all of that AI can very easily help in saying, you know, this, you know, less costly or more costly or whatever. So I think this is where is gonna is gonna go from the software side. However, I do not see because I've not seen projects on the hardware side. What I mean by that is I've not really seen machines coming up with a new paradigm to change the game. Uh, and maybe that's not needed. I don't know. So I have not seen an EV car of manufacturing sort of. Mm coming along where Haas is saying, I'm gonna make the next generation of machine. So that in next five years, probably is not gonna change because I have not seen anything coming unless mm -hmm. somebody comes out of the blue. However, on the software side, probably 
it'll be a bunch of small things as Milan, you were talking about. Uh, I, I still believe if you really want to revolutionize this whole thing, then there is a big thing happen and that has to happen from the hardware machine side and not, not the software side. Gotcha. All right, Milan, you're wrapping us up. So this better be good. I, I, I won't break the theme, but um, I think at the end of the day, uh, improving manufacturing is all about reducing choices. Uh, I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's if you get people 80% to their goal and you let them make decisions for the last 20%, I think you address a lot of issues for two reasons. I think everybody knows in US, what is it, two and a half million people, vacancies in manufacturing. We are onshoring. I was at a DOD event in Rhode Island. And they were basically talking, you know, we can build 900 factories tomorrow. That's not a problem. The problem is where are you going to find people who work in all these factories? And secondarily, how are you going to educate them uh, in order to be efficient users of all this equipment, as Suchit so, so eloquently said, which means you have to build better user experiences around systems. That's one part of it. And second is you have to have build some sort of assistive intelligence that gets people, you know, three quarters of the way there. I agree with everybody that we're in an inflection point where AI with enough training can do that because there's enough data coming in that you can train it relatively easily to do that. What I don't think we should focus on is to replace humans 100% because that's not, I think, achievable in our lifetimes. Um, but focus on smaller things which will affect a great deal of what happens in the future, the way I see it. So I think that in five years, right. we probably will be, should be able to deliver that. Yeah, don't, don't sacrifice some improvements in automation in the, the quest for a that 100%, the last mile is going to be a hard, hard mile for the automation. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to join us for the conversation. I knew that these brilliant minds would create some, <laughs> some really interesting conversations. Hopefully, everybody learned something new and made some good connections. And I'm sure I'll see each of you around in the circuit of industry events and other stuff. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Lovely to meet everyone. Yeah, cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us on the Beyond 3D podcast, hosted by TechSoft 3D. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and leave us a review, or subscribe on SoundCloud. To listen to past episodes or learn more about TechSoft 3D, visit www.techsoft3d.com forward slash blog. Send us comments and suggestions at info at techsoft3d.com. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you'll join us again on the next episode of Beyond 3D.